exactly the same idea. They say that in Bangalore, every second person writes code, and everybody honks at the traffic lights. Honking is a major pastime out here. So you tend to get bored, you generally honk for some time. <laughs> it makes you feel nice. <laughs> in India, we have uh, computers as part of the curriculum. Now it starts in class three, grade three, as you would call it. Uh -huh. So I've been doing some kind of programming or other since uh, class eight. When I was there, it was class eight. Uh -huh. So once I finished my bachelor's, I got into a non-formal institute for computer learning. And then started uh, programming. Programmers in Bangalore are awake when America is asleep. The internet has perfected the 24-hour workday. <laughs> You're working when your customer is sleeping. Uh -huh. Okay, to that extent, if he gives you a problem during his working hours, you solve it and send it back to him by the time he starts working. So, I mean, it's, it's a great advantage, especially if you're doing things offshore. We get a call in the evening through email saying there's a problem. Next day morning when people come to the US, problem is solved. Ah. While the customer gets surprised saying, well, I just told you at 5 o'clock in the evening, how come in the morning you guys solved it? Now the problem is solved in the other part of the world by really using this 24-hour development cycle. It's not only cricket the British Empire gave India, it also made English the language of government and higher education, which gives Indian engineers another great advantage. People here know English, unlike Japan or China and places like that. People know English, you know, so that is a lingua franca of, you know, software. You have to know English. My kids uh, study in an English medium school. They cannot uh, read or write my own, own mother tongue, which I'm able to do it, but the next generation is not able to do that. Same way you'll find that Indians don't have pr problems speaking of languages. They can speak French, they can speak, you know, Belgian probably, you know. Most of the languages, people going from here, they pick up very easily. For an American, especially an American from Silicon Valley, it's almost impossible to imagine India as a high technology development center. I mean, just look around. This, this is amazing. The average person in an Indian school learns at least three languages, English, Hindi, and their local language. Some of them know five or six. Compare that to American students. Think about it in terms of computer languages. What are they? They have uh, syntax, they have characters, they have objects, they have verbs. What's the difference between C++ and Hindi? Not all that much, really. They have a 5,000-year tradition of mathematics, which we don't. After the World Wide Web and the browser, there's a third breakout invention that's driving the expansion of the web lifestyle. It's called Java, a network programming language named after the valley's favorite fuel. Like the others, it's helped make the internet easier to use for anyone, anywhere, and with any kind of computer. Because the internet grew in such a haphazard way, the computers on it use many different programming languages. This wasn't a problem when the networks were separate, but when the World Wide Web made it possible for them to communicate, there had to be a way to make it easy. A guy named James Gosling came up with the answer. He invented a language that would run the same on any computer, one size fit it all, which was good for business. And like everything else on the internet, it had a strange name, Java. Maybe he drank too much coffee while working on his invention. Better than naming it Budweiser. One of the most brilliant programmers on the planet, Bill Joycosm, the greatest programmer in the world, came into my office one day because I'd heard he was upset. And I said, James Gosling, what's the matter? Why aren't you happy? This was like in the early 90s. And he says, I'm tired of dealing with all this old legacy computer environment. It's just, for a great programmer, it's, it's kind of like trying to fly by flapping your wings. And he said, I want to go out and create a new environment. It was conceived way back in 1990, 91 time frame um, by a few engineers at Sun Microsystems who wanted to create a better, uh, better world um, in terms of software delivery, software um, deployment. And they were imagining consumers being plugged into this networked world. What they didn't realize at the time was it was the internet, it was going to be the internet. What's Java? I mean, Java is a building material. I mean, it's, it's, like, it's like concrete. Um, it's something that you can use to build software out of. But it's a material that's got some, some pretty different properties. 
the one that has sort of gotten the most airtime and most people hear about is right once, run anywhere, or being architecture neutral, uh, where you can sort of write a program once and it will actually run on different machines. Um, and it can rove across the network. And I said, hey, I don't care what you want to do. Whoever you want to do it, whenever, how long, ever long, with whoever, for as much money, I'll set you up in a room, I'll give you all the raw meat and jolt cola and potato chips you want, anything you need, for as long as you want, just go do something great. He said, really? I said, yeah, now get out of here. So he went off, we set him up in downtown Palo Alto, and they started hiring a bunch of really great people, and they, you know, it was kind of like Groundhog Day. They'd come out every now and then, they'd look around, and I'd look and see what they had, and I'd go, I don't get it. And they'd go, okay, so they'd go back in. Certainly early on, I don't think Scott had a good idea what it was about or what it was for. Uh, you know, it was sort of this, this group of, you know, rabble-rousers off in the corner doing something really odd that he didn't know how it related to their main business. Um, and, you know, the truth is that at, you know, in the early times, it didn't relate to the main business. Everyone knows that if you go to the computer store, you have to buy software that runs on Windows or a different piece of software that runs on the Mac. With Java, you can take a single program and it will run on both and it will run on both well. That opportunity was created because of the, the internet. Because the internet is a mixed network and it doesn't make sense to have 20 versions of your software on a single server. So the promise of the internet coincided just at the right time with the great inventions by people like James Gosling in the language. It's taken the world by storm. It, uh, it's very clearly now going to be in some 300 million computers just three years from now. I think there's 200 books on the market right now on Java, 4 million programmers programming in it, and it's uh, only 700 days old, so that's phenomenal. I've done many things that have gotten very popular, but amongst a very sort of nerdy community. Um, because the, the kind of stuff I do is stuff that I have no idea how to explain it to my mom. And, and, or even explain, you know, even at a high level why it's interesting to my mom. And so it tends to stay in a fairly closed community. And to have something that has touched people's everyday lives um, surprised, the, surprised me. The 1990s internet has spun off two significant challenges for Bill Gates. Both Netscape's browser and Sun's programming language Java were not invented at Microsoft. Bill was slow to see the challenge at first, then he took action. Here on the shore of Lake Washington near Seattle stands a monument to Bill Gates' brilliance, or at least to his money. The last time anyone tried to estimate, Bill's new house was going to cost $50 million. But over the last two years, his wealth has increased at a rate of $31 million per day. So no matter what it costs, it doesn't matter. Bill Gates didn't get to be the richest man in the world just because he's smart or just because he's lucky. It's because he's smart and lucky and knows it and pushes his every advantage to the limit. Bill had largely ignored the internet. How could a non-commercial network offer a business opportunity? But by 1994, there was growing buzz about the web and Netscape, especially among new Microsoft recruits fresh from college. At the urging of the troops, Bill went surfing. It was an all-nighter that changed Microsoft and the internet industry. Bill went down to his place in the uh, Hood Canal and with instructions on how to get on and what to go look for and he got on and started looking around and then started just going from site to site and I think eventually spent the greater part of all night on the, on the net and came back and had a meeting and described that uh, the experience and said that uh, he was kind of blown away with just how much was really there. Well, we always assumed that Microsoft would be our biggest enemy um, because they would have to uh, turn their attention to this. Uh, we got lucky for a while in that they just they weren't paying attention. Um, there were people inside Microsoft who knew what Microsoft should do to respond to us, but the management team at Microsoft was sort of almost willfully ignoring what was happening. <laughs> 